to welcome back. We have said often during this course that the choice of predicates is a very important thing and that is a matter which logicians do not bother about too much because they are more concerned with the theorem proving strategies and so on. Whereas, from the knowledge representation point of view, the choice of predicates is of important, is very important. So, let me do a recap of some things we had said earlier that choosing predicates arbitrarily necessitates adding rules which work with the predicates. Because if you are going to add predicates to your knowledge base, then the only use that predicates can have is if there are rules which are operating upon them, uh, which allow you to make inferences with them. So, the more the number of predicates you choose, the more the number of rules you would have to add, which basically means that choosing arbitrary predicates from English language, if we are talking in English, uh, does not make sense because for every such predicate you would have by had to write rules or something like that. We had seen at some point that we could use something like WordNet to translate them into synonyms, but that is another way of doing things. What we want to look at now is that can we define a conceptual domain which is independent of natural language terms. So, that the predicates that we define in some sense are not, let us say in English essentially. Hmm? We have already said that the, the, the name we use for a predicate is irrelevant because we can have any interpretation for any predicate. But what we are now saying is that explore the world of concepts and choose a canonical set of predicates in terms of which you will be able to express everything else. So, can we think of such a set? So, as I had said even then that Roger Shank and his group in the mid 70s uh, at Yale University, they did a lot of work in this area and they developed what is called as conceptual dependency theory, uh, which had a very small set of predicates. And now, we will take a quick look at that. For various reasons, that approach did not survive primarily because it was very manual work intensive that somebody had to sit and do all that stuff. But in the end, if you want to be reap the benefits of knowledge representation, you have to somehow get into it. Of course, we can try learning approaches or teaching approaches whereby we can teach a machine the meanings of words in terms of the predicates that we are defining, but we will leave that for later essentially. Let us try to see how this whole idea works. So, perception or understanding, the work of Roger Shank and his group at Yale was focused on understanding natural language stories and their idea was to read stuff in English and understand it we will see what we mean by understanding and be able to answer questions based on that. One advantage of representing whatever you are reading in a language independent format is that if you want to generate language from that, you can put it a generator for different languages. And so, you can read a text piece of text in English, convert it into CD theory and generate it into Hindi, let us say, if you have a generator for Hindi. So, that is an idea which natural language translation also had pursued for a while, which is that of an interlingua, a language which is common to, uh, a representation which is common to many languages. Uh, but more recently, again, that has gone out of fashion because uh, working with parallel text corpora has proven to be effective in many domains. So, when we say understanding, we basically mean perception in the sense that making sense of some inputs, not just labeling it, but creating an internal representation of whatever you are seeing or hearing or reading. So, you could do it in natural language understanding, speech understanding, image understanding. The thesis that this group put forward is that understanding has a strong top down component. It involves concept driven mapping into preconceived notions rather than data driven bottom up approach essentially that you already have in your head uh, 
what you can understand. It's just a question of mapping the incoming information into those internal representations. We have seen this uh, example earlier, so I will not dwell upon this. We will just keep it in the uh, slides so that you can go over them again. But basically, this is a story of this guy called John who is upset with Mary and uh, he they are having some conversation. And as this conversation goes on, the listener has some expectations and we had listed out that expectations can come through various sources because of the syntax of language, because of the meaning of what people are saying, because of the context in which the, the conversation is happening, because of conversational rules. For example, people talk for a certain reason, because of the world view of a listener, what do you know about the other person and because of cultural norms essentially, because different cultures have different ways in which they interact with each other. And then we had said uh, that uh, one would be very surprised uh, if he said that change the topic and said, oh, I want to go and eat some fish. And we had also observed that jokes often exploit such violation of expectation. So, the whole idea of top down understanding is that as you are getting information, you are processing it and generating expectations as to what will come next. And when you see something which you are expecting, then in some sense, you keep adding to that information essentially. And we will see this a little bit. So, here is a small video that uh, I wanted to show. This was uh, given to me by uh, Richard Gregory who came from Canada and it is, it illustrates the fact that what you see is controlled to a large extent from what you expect to see essentially. So, here is this uh, uh, face mask of Charlie Chaplin who I think everybody knows. And this mask is a hollow mask and it is going to rotate about the vertical axis and we can hear what Gregory says about what is happening there essentially. Let me play this. The hollow head, actually at the moment it is a perfectly normal head of Charlie Chaplin but wait as it comes round you will see or will you that it is hollow, the back of it coming round now. It's actually a hollow mask. It appears to rotate in the opposite direction, and amazingly, the nose sticks out, although it's actually sticking in. Coming round now is the normal, correct as it were, face, and wait again as it comes round, and you'll see this extraordinary thing like Jekyll and Hyde. Both the noses stick out because it's so unlikely that a nose sticks in, that a face is hollow. So, you see it as convex, although it's in fact concave as now, and then it will become the normal face again, there. And note that as soon as the features appear in the hollow inside, it will look convex as though it's a normal face almost, though it isn't. As soon as the features appear, there. Your brain refuses to see it as hollow simply because it is so unlikely. And this demonstrates the immense power of top down knowledge, which will actually counter signals, bottom up from the senses, and force an extraordinary illusion in which the sensory information of the present is cancelled by immense knowledge derived from the past because you've seen so many faces all with their noses sticking out. Go to this website which is called Ames Window, uh, which talks about such similar illusions. The whole idea of illusions is that we have certain expectations about what we are seeing 
and sometimes we refuse to accept that what we are seeing is not what is exactly happening essentially. Let me back up for a second. This is the first part of a three-part illusion. What do you see? Well, there's a window and it's turning, except it stops and reverses direction. So the window is oscillating back and forth. That's what most people see when they look at this illusion, except that's not what the window is actually doing. It's on this turntable and it is rotating continuously. This is known as the Ames Window Illusion, and I saw it on an old Australian TV program called The Curiosity Show, and I was curious. So in this video, I'm gonna dig deeper into this illusion than anyone has before. You know, the window itself is not a rectangle, but a trapezoid. You can see this side here is much shorter than this side over here, and that is essential to the illusion. Also essential, it is shaded to make it look 3D, but it's actually just a two-dimensional card with the same image on both sides. So now that you know exactly what this object looks like and what it's doing, can you correctly perceive the rotation rather than the oscillation? I still can't. It still looks to my brain like this window is going back and forth. Okay, here's an idea. I'm going to attach this Rubik's Cube to the short side of the trapezoid so we can keep track of it as it goes around. You ready? Okay. Okay, the Rubik's Cube is going around. Everything seems normal. But now, what is that? It looks like the Rubik's Cube is continuing to go around but the window is oscillating back and forth. There goes the Rubik's Cube around the back. I don't even know what's happening. Whoa! Look at that! It looks like the Rubik's Cube is out drifting by itself, out in front of the whole illusion. What is happening? Okay, new plan. I'm going to take off the Rubik's Cube. Okay, so you're back and... Uh... This should give you some idea of how our mind influences what we see, essentially. When we meet next, we will look at the work that Shank and his group did at Yale University. So, see you in the next slide.